Hello, everybody. This is Empowering Democracy. It's another Dump the Corruption show. Our topic for tonight is Dump the Corruption, the Red Berets, and other movements uh, for change. And our point of departure here is the event last night on Tuesday, 9th of April, 2024, at 8 p.m., the Cornell West campaign in collaboration with the Red Berets, Medicare for All, and the Healing Us uh, Network held the candlelight vigil for Danny DeNoyer and Medicare for All. Uh, in case you don't know, Danny DeNoyer is the son of Scott uh, DeNoyer. And a few years back, he committed uh, um, suicide because he wasn't able to get um, um, his medication, which cost only $20 from his insurance company. And uh, they voided um, his insurance. And then he really couldn't get it because the price without insurance was $250. He became despondent, which was a predictable result, and he drove his car into the Mohawk River, a great uh, tragedy which motivates the fight for Medicare for All okay, today. So going on, the vigil featured candle lighting by some of the virtual participants, including Scott DeNoyer, who led the candle lighting uh, the ceremony. Okay. It also included a showing of the excellent and moving documentary, Healing Us, a film by Kenny Ballantyne and Maddie Purvis. And Kelly, Kenny Ballantyne is the director and Maddie uh, Purvis was the film editor. It was narrated by Susan Sarandon on the need for a compassionate uh, and universal healthcare system. The event also included a panel discussion featuring the Red Berets and Healing Us Network participants, including Dr. Victoria Dooley, um, MD, who was one of the surrogates for Bernie Sanders in 2020. Uh, and uh, okay, the discussion uh, was about the push for Medicare for All via executive order under Section 1881A of the Social Security Act, and a challenge. Okay, and a, also there was a petition uh, launch of a collective action to challenge the current administration's opposition and to advocate for health justice in memory of Danny. I participated in the Zoom call event, and at the end of the uh, Q&A session, I asked why, since the documentary and discussion sections highlighted the decisive role of money in politics in blocking Medicare for All campaigns in the face of polling, showing that 70% of the voting public favored it, there was no dump the corruption movement being carried out by the participants, that is, the Red Beret participants, to replace all candidates for Congress and the presidency who were taking the big money, blocking not only the passage of Medicare for All, but also actions on such issue as the complicity of the United States in Gaza and a host of other key issues. The issue of the climate emergency comes to mind, of course. Uh, okay, the issue of uh, uh, full employment, uh, the issues of inflation, uh, well, specifically price gouging, which was a huge cause of the inflation, the issues of economic concentration, okay, and inequality, and a host of other issues. The answers I received to my question were disappointing. People felt they were doing what they could to overcome the role of money in politics now, there was no sentiment in favor of supporting a movement specifically targeting the recipients of big money for defeat in 2024. 
This episode of Empowering Democracy expresses my thoughts on this response and is directed toward all uh, change movements currently being blocked due to the role of money in politics, but specifically toward the Red Berets, who have been working particularly hard to pass single-payer uh, legislation at both the national and state levels um, here in the United States. So with that as introduction, here are my thoughts before I give them. Uh, let me greet the folks who are here. Steve Wolfbrand is here. Hello, Steve and Robert Copeland. Hey, Robert, glad to see you here today. So, uh, okay, my thoughts are really very simple. Of course, Medicare for All is being blocked, both at the state level and at the federal level, by the big money that's being taken by legislators and or the big money that's being used uh, uh, against the attempts to get a ballot initiative uh, we saw the actions of big money in California. Now, was it a couple of years ago? I think it was. Uh, they were a bill which had, uh, was supposed to be getting a vote in the California Assembly, never got one because it was withdrawn by the person who introduced okay, the bill because of the steep opposition from Democratic colleagues not from Republican colleagues who are expected to oppose it, but of course the California Assembly is overwhelmingly democratic uh, and supposedly overwhelmingly in support okay, of single payer. But enough people had been bought off that they didn't want to have a knockdown drag out fight over it and they never allowed a vote to come to the floor. Uh, in spite of the fact that supposedly a majority of the people in the assembly were for Medicare for All, claimed to be for Medicare for All. Of course, in Washington, for years, the Red Berets have been trying to get a ballot initiative done. Uh, they haven't been able to get enough uh, signatures to force okay, a ballot initiative in spite of huge efforts, okay, on their part. And of course, they've been pressuring the legislature as well. And in that, um, Cleveland in the Senate in Washington has been blocking them. They cannot get their bill uh, seriously considered in the Senate. It cannot be brought up for a vote in the Senate because in that Cleveland is simply bought off and is blocking it. In New York, there have been attempts for years now to get a single-payer bill through the New York Assembly and State Senate. In the Assembly, Carl Heasty, the Speaker, okay, is bottling it up uh, while making motions as if maybe he likes it, but he's bottling it up. And in the Senate in New York, um, um, Andrea Cousins, has been bottling it up there for years. It cannot come to vote, okay, in the Senate. So it's blocked there. Currently, there are some vigorous efforts going on in Minnesota dedicated to bringing a bill to the floor. It remains to be seen whether that bill will be blocked. But uh, there's a lot of corporate activity at the state level, too, blocking these particular bills. At the federal level, of course, the Speaker of the House, well, the Republicans are totally bought, totally opposed to Medicare for All. Okay, and the Democrats, of course, no longer have control of the House. But when they do, their Speaker is likely to be, uh, okay, the majority leader. Uh, I'm sorry, the minority leader, okay, in the House, who is, of course, uh, of course, what's his name again? <laughs> Um, Hakeem Jeffries. So Hakeem Jeffries, of course, was groomed by Nancy Pelosi and is a major, uh, 
is a major supporter or is being supported in a major way by the healthcare industrial complex and has been for years bought by the healthcare RK industrial complex. It's, it's quite likely that he will follow the lead of Nancy Pelosi for so many years, which is not to allow a Medicare for all bill to come to the floor, uh, but to the fore. Even if it got to the fore there, it, the health care bill would likely be bottled up okay, in the Senate and a filibuster would probably defeat it there, even if it's, there was some miracle and it got through the House. Of course, the majority leader of the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, is terribly against, okay, a Medicare for all bill because he's the senator from Wall Street and Wall Street is dead set against Okay, the Medicare for all bill. But last but not least, the current president of the United States has said if the Medicare for all bill ever came to his desk, he would veto it. I don't actually believe him, but it's a strong statement of opposition anyway. I think if it made it through the Senate, Joe Biden would probably buckle. But, you know, that's an opinion of mine on the face of it. The president is unalterably opposed. The Speaker of the House is unalterably opposed, or, or at least a Democratic Speaker of the House would be if they got control of the House once again, okay, in the next election. And, of course, the leadership in the Senate, okay, would definitely be opposed. Okay, so one party is totally opposed. Okay, a lot of people in the second party, the Democratic Party, are also bought off by the healthcare industry. You can't get Medicare for all bill through the Congress in spite of uh, widespread polling support. Roughly 70% of the voting population of the country is for Medicare for all to pass. Uh, this hasn't always been the case, but for years it's been at least 65% and now it's at 70%. And polls show that the very heavy majority of the voters in the Democratic Party are very favorable towards the Medicare for All bill, somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 to 88 uh, percent. The independents are in support of a Medicare for All bill by 72 or 73 percent. Even the Republicans are for a Medicare for All bill. That is voting Republicans, whether MAGA or not. But are for it by 52 to 54 percent. So the country is for it. It can't be brought um, but to a vote. Now, we have movements such as the Red Berets, or supporters, okay, of Medicare for All, that continue working for it. And the event of last night, of course, was a movement was a uh, a movement event in favor okay, of Medicare for all, trying to reignite support for it, okay, and enthusiasm for it. But what is the theory of change of these movements in order to get okay, a Medicare for all bill through, in order to pass it? I think it is to convince even more people to support it or to convince those people who now support it to support it even more intensely. My question is, okay, is, is the theory of change there that if we do that, if there are more people who support it, if the support rises from 70% on the average to 80% on the average and for Democrats, okay, uh, rises from 88% uh, to 95%, that this will be enough uh, to get a vote on Medicare for all through Congress. Is this theory, is that kind of theory of change correct? Well, there's a lot of sentiment expressed at the event uh, last night 
that the Medicare for All bill can't get through because of the role of money in politics. And that, of course, is what I'm talking about here, too. Can't get through because of the role of money uh, uh, in politics. If the support increases from 85 to 88% to 95% okay, on the Democratic side, and increases uh, from roughly 72%, okay, to 80% on the independent side, and let's say from 54% to 58% on the Republican side, which is what more lobbying of the kind the Reb Rays are doing okay, is likely to result in, would that be enough to get these bills through Congress at the federal level or through uh, the state legislatures uh, uh, in places like California and Washington and New York, okay, and Minnesota, uh, okay, would uh, that kind of rise in support actually be enough? Well, I don't think okay, the theory of change which says that would be enough is correct. I think the role of money is too strong. It ties up uh, the leadership in the legislatures, both federal and state. And as long as it ties the leadership and given the structure of Congress and the state legislatures, even though the bills for single payer are so popular, uh, among the people, those bills can't even get support because they can't get to the floor. They can't be voted on on the floor because the leadership is opposed to them. And you can't force those leaders to get the bills to the floor. What happens if you were to defeat okay, the leaders, run campaigns to defeat okay, the leadership in the state legislatures and in the House okay, and Senate? Well, what's likely to happen is that even if you were successful in doing that, the new leaders would likely be opposed okay, to Medicare for All. We just saw an example of that at the federal level where Nancy Pelosi retired. She did everything she could to get Hakeem Jeffries to be the person who replaced her. The opposition to Nancy Pelosi and uh, Hakeem Jeffries quickly folded. It wasn't even serious opposition, even though they knew if Hakeem Jeffries were to take over the House, the prospects for Medicare for All would be dim on the Democratic side they still allowed it to happen. There was no serious challenge to Hakeem Jeffries. Um, here, Robert Copeland says, we can't even get a town hall meeting with Doris Matsui, who is my house member, to try to get Medicare for all. Right. Doris Matsui has been his house member for, I don't know how many years now, I'd say off the top of my head, 20 years. And she won't even have a town hall meeting where discussion of Medicare for all is on uh, the agenda. That's not unusual. People know the leaders are opposed to it. The orders they get from the leaders are don't bring it up. Don't discuss it in town halls. Don't position it so it has a chance okay, to pass. And, but even more, don't position it so that a vote on it will embarrass us because we're going to have to vote against it because our buyers, our donors, want us to vote against it if it ever gets to the floor. And so we don't want you to embarrass us. Okay, This is what the people in the pocket of the health insurance industry say to their colleagues in the state legislatures, in the Senate, uh, uh, in the House, they say, we will be very angry at you if you force a vote, which forces us to say no 
forces us to say no. That's what made Ash Calera in California pull his bill okay, last time because people who had said they were for Medicare for all didn't want to be embarrassed by having to vote against it because their donors were demanding that. So it's not enough to get rid of the leaders. What has to happen is there has to be a house cleaning because the need is to get rid of the toxic money. It's the money itself that is toxic. But how do you get rid of the toxic money? After all, according to the Supreme Court, that money is speech. So it's always there for people to have, okay, if they want to accept it. And there are great competitive pressures on them to accept it and to be bought, because if they're not bought, the health insurance people will fund their opposition in primaries or will fund their opposition in the General Assembly. Robert Copeland says the Matsui family has been in the House before Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States. Yeah, but how long has Doris Matsui herself been the congressperson, Robert? I wonder. I seem to remember it's about 20 years I wouldn't be surprised if it was 30 years. 20 years was off the top of my head. But, uh, okay, it's the seniority system in these legislatures and the power structure that accounts for the fact, okay, that Medicare for all can't get a vote. I don't believe that even if we raise the general level of support across the board, to 80% in various places and to 95% in the Democratic Party members, among the Democratic Party members, I still don't think it could get through the House or the Senate or the state legislatures where we're working very hard for it. And the reason why I can't get through, because I say again, is the fact that the legislators are bought this is going to require a legislative um, uh, revolution at the state level and at the national level to get these bills actually moving. On the other hand, enough support, in my theory, already exists to immediately pass these bills if the money were not in the way. So if I'm someone who's for the Green New Deal or for whose Medicare for, or, or for who, as I am, who's a strong supporter okay, of Medicare for all, to me, the rational thing to do is to stop pushing for Medicare for all so hard and because everybody's convinced already. 70% of the popul of voting population is already convinced so I don't know, I don't think there's any need to convince any more people, to persuade any more people. What there's a need for is to get the money out of politics so the bills can move. How do we get uh, the money out of politics? The answer is we defeat everyone who is taking big money. What is big money? Well, I define that in a uh, little graphic that you've seen here many, many times, but I'm going to put up the graphic again because uh, where the hell is my goddamn graphic? <laughs> I know I had it up here earlier today. What happened to the sucker? Oh, here it is. All right. I'm going to post it. This is the rule for the dump the corruption movement. It is a simple rule. If I can find it again, here we go. Well, I've got it up. Oh, here it is. 
sometimes you're staring right at it and you go blind. There is the rule. Vote against every candidate who won't take money. Oh, uh, vote against every candidate except those who won't take money from wealthy corporations, uh, wealthy individuals, uh, PACs, or party committees like the carry committees, and who repudiate all super PAC support. That's a simple rule. At the national level, uh, based on the surveys of Congress people we've done on this particular program, we've done 205, uh, including something like 33 senators, and 172 House people, altogether 205 people. And we found that every candidate was taking money from wealthy courts or party committees or PACs or super PACs, or at least from wealthy individuals. What's a wealthy individual? It's somebody who can afford to contribute more than $200 to a campaign. So basically, you have to vote against everybody except those who wholly fund their campaigns with donations of $200 or less. That's what you have to do if you want action. Since March 2005, when she took over when her husband, Robert Matsui, died. So I was off by one year. She came in in March 2005, and it now is April 2024. She's been in there for 19 years. Gee, 20-year estimate was a pretty good estimate, wasn't it? So there's the rule again. I'll remove it. I haven't been able to get a campaign going for people to use this rule. So here are the Red Berets. Here are other movements in back of other policies, like paid family leave, like once more having choice over their own bodies for women, like of the Green New Deal, like the Federal Job Guarantee, uh, like uh, paid family leave, like housing for all, so no one has to sleep on the street anymore. There are all these movements out there for all these various things. They're all being blocked by money uh, in politics. I think Medicare for All is one of the two most serious instances of things being blocked okay, by money in politics. I think the other one okay, is most probably the Green New Deal. These bills are being blocked there are myriad supporters of these movements. The appeal I'm making tonight and the appeal completely in line with what the Red Berets were trying to do. The appeal I'm making tonight is for all these movements to come together into a movement of movements to follow the rule in the election of 2024 and sweep the Congress out. It will mean sweeping every congressperson out unless between now and uh, um, election time uh, in November, they stop taking the big money. If everybody were to come together okay, and vote against them, 
uh, then the result would be a completely new Congress at the beginning of 2025. Since the rule includes candidates for Congress, both incumbents and challengers, it would also mean that no new House members would be elected if they too were taking big money. So if everybody followed the rule, the only House members who would be elected would be people who were not bought. If they were just people from the general population and were representative of that population, then 70% of them or more would be for Medicare for All. And Medicare for All would pass the House. Now, there's still the Senate. There are 33 or 34 members of the Senate standing for re-election in 2024. Every one of them would be defeated if the rule were applied okay, in the Senate. 33 new members would be elected who would be unbought. There are enough Democrats who oppose the filibuster not standing for election in 2024 that it would be possible to, lose, to use okay, the nuclear option in the new Senate of 2025 to add 18 more votes okay, in the Senate. Okay, to get a majority of uh, 51 votes to remove the filibuster rule from the Senate. So legislation there would pass then by majority vote. And of course, there would then be a majority in favor there would be a majority in favor of Medicare for all at that point because the new Congress people would probably be uniformly in favor. I'm sorry, the new senators would probably be uniformly in favor, okay, of Medicare for all. You want Medicare for all? Stop trying to convince more people than are necessary to be in favor of Medicare for all. Start trying to get money out of politics because that's what's blocking Medicare for all. It's not the lack of popular support that is blocking Medicare for all. It's not the lack of popular support that's blocking the Green New Deal. It's not the lack of popular support that is stopping a national bill guaranteeing the right of women to have abortion to pass. It's not lack of support. The theory of change that says that his lack of support is wrong. The support is there. What we need is to get the money out of Congress by getting the people out of Congress who are taking the money. That's the point. It's a simple point. I've been making it again, again, and again. But the way our system is set up, the interest groups, such as the Red Berets, who support a particular policy, are focused on that policy. And they're using the theory of change that says, if we get more supporters, it will pass the Congress. And that theory of change is wrong. And that's, and I'm not saying that the Red Berets do not understand that it's money that is blocking this. At the event okay, uh, last night, there were a number of people who were making comments and asking questions who were talking about the role of money in the Healing Us film itself. In the Healing Us film itself, 
the role of money in politics is mentioned at least four or five times in that film as decisive in stopping Medicare for all. But nobody is saying, oh, according to my indicator, 11 are watching, okay, across uh, the three platforms, the Twitter platform, the Facebook platform, okay, and the YouTube platform. So uh, there could be 11 in the chat, but most of the people watching are not in the chat, but they certainly could be, Steve. So anyway, uh, they recognize it's money blocking Medicare for all. So why don't they have an influence strategy? Why they don't they have a pressure strategy that goes after the money first? Why aren't they rational enough to say to themselves, look, we have the support for these popular policies. Now what we have to do is get the money out. So we have to join together to get the money out. Why aren't the Red Berets creating coalitions with the Green New Deal people? Why aren't they creating coalitions with the choice people? Why aren't they creating coalitions with the family leave people? Why aren't they creating coalitions with the people who are lobbying very vigorously now for low-cost housing to end the housing crisis? It's the new cause. It's the new cause the progressives in Congress are touting right now, saying we can't tolerate this housing crisis any longer. We have to end the housing crisis. Well, guess what? There are lobbies in Washington that don't want the housing crisis solved. They don't want people to have cheap housing. Why don't they want people to have cheap housing? Because they think it's going to lower the property values. They think if housing is not scarce, the property values are going to go down. Guess what? They're probably right. They probably will go down. And what's important to them? Not solving the housing crisis but that their own property be worth the maximum it possibly can be worth. So, yeah, Robert Colton points out a lot of people are single-issue activists. That's right. And they can be single-issue activists. What I'm saying is that for all the single-issue activists, there's this block in the way, and it's the money in politics. And if we're going to win, if we're going to win, if each of these movements is going to win, it has to coalesce with other movements to get rid of the block, which is the big donations in politics, the big money in politics. It's so much worse now. It's so much worse now even than it's ever been. Look at Bobby Kennedy's campaign. Last time I looked at the last report from Open Secrets, he had raised $72 million. Super PAC had raised 72, oh, I'm sorry. There was, uh, yeah, $72 million, okay, all told. Uh, his campaign had raised $27 million. Uh, just about the balance, something like $47 million uh, had been raised by uh, the American Values Super PAC, which is the super PAC that favors his campaign and is supposedly not in coordination with it. There were three primary donors to the super PAC, there was Timothy Mellon, 
who had contributed $20 million to the Super PAC and four contributions of $5 million each. Uh, there was, uh, uh, what's, okay. there was the head of a security firm Okay, or a security firm whose name escapes me right now, who contributed $10 million to the American Value Super PAC in a number of smaller contributions. I think there was a $5 million contribution, a $4 million contribution, and a number of smaller contributions, which all told total $10 million. That's $30 million. And then there was another $4 million that was contributed by a very rich individual, and that four million helped to fund, helped to fund his big Super Bowl act. And the one who contributed that was a, a shell company of Nicole Shanahan's. Okay. So as you know, even though supposedly the Super PAC was not coordinating uh, with the campaign. It turned out that one of these big donors, specifically Nicole Shanahan, became the vice presidential candidate for Bobby Kennedy. Okay, now I'm not against that actually, because I'm glad that that money is now inside the campaign as opposed to outside the campaign. I'm glad that he's not going to owe his soul to a bunch of people, but primarily to Nicole Shanahan, who's his vice presidential candidate. So there's kind of a balance of power there. If he were to win, she would be the vice president. He would be the president. And they'd probably be compromising on various kinds of policies because she was the money behind his uh, um, campaign. I don't think that would be too bad. It would be a lot better than the situation with Trump and Biden who have many, many, many very rich people supporting them. Okay, so I, I think that situation, okay, is better. Uh, okay, but that's not really the point. Okay, the point is that huge monetary contributions, bigger than ever before, can affect these particular campaigns. That is what we are looking at right now. And these big contributions can be made to super PACs to fight over issues also. If Medicare for All was really getting hot again, you would see super PACs fighting Medicare for All that were getting $10 million contributions from people from the healthcare industry. Numerous $10 million contributions. I'll bet if there was a serious campaign that got serious support for passing Medicare for All, $200 million, $300 million would be flying around like nobody's business to try to block it. With a Congress that was already bought, it certainly would succeed in blocking any serious movement. But if it was a new Congress that was not bought, whose members knew that they all won because of the dump the corruption campaign, they would be unlikely to take that money again because they'd be afraid that it would doom them the next time around and that no matter how much super PAC money they got, it wouldn't help them because dump the corruption would have proven it can take out anybody who takes uh, the money. That's the importance of making dump the corruption successful in 2000, okay, and 24. So that by 2025, we can have people looking to the voters for support and not looking to the donors for support. So that is so important. Uh, so, again, my appeal here, and I will stop appealing in just a minute, 
and start considering your comments. But my appeal here is to the Red Berets and other key interests okay, across the board to create coalitions to get the big money out of politics by using the rule that I've constructed. If people think this rule isn't good enough, I challenge them to create a better, simple rule than voters should follow. But we need a dump the corruption campaign that's a cross-issue campaign where uh, the activists in each of the issue areas combine realizing their common enemy is the big money in politics. And the cure for that is getting all the big money people out of politics, which is to say almost everybody right now. You have to create, if you want to pass a single payer bill in Washington, you have to get Annette Cleveland out of office and you have to make it clear to everybody watching that she was defeated and other people who weren't supportive of single payer were defeated because of the movement to get money out of politics. The same applies in New York State. The same applies in Minnesota. The same applies in California. People who are blocking it in California need to be defeated. That includes the freaking governor. By the way, if he ever decides to run for president, he needs to be defeated there too because he's completely bought by lots and lots of interests. So, I appeal to the Red Berets to start constructing such a coalition. Stop spending so much time on trying to get people to see the film. I know everybody worked hard on the film. I myself love the film. It's a wonderful film. I want to get it exposed to everybody also. But stop working so hard to do that. Start working hard. Start giving priority to the main issue, which is getting the toxic money out of politics so that the 70% of voters who are for Medicare for All can win the day in Congress. That's what it's about now. It's not mainly about getting everybody to see this film. You can get everybody to see this film, 85 to 90% of the people could have this film in mind okay, when they go to vote for candidates. And the candidates necessary to vote in single payer would still not vote for single payer once they get in because the leadership structure would tie them up and would prevent a vote for single payer for getting to the floor. Your theory of change is not working. It hasn't worked. I believe the Red Berets have been working on this theory of change at least since 2018. It's six years now. It looks like it's farther away than ever. I heard people last night talking about we have to be in this for the long run. This is going to take a long time. What do you mean it's going to take a long time? You already got 70% of the voters in back of it. Why should it take a long time? It shouldn't be taking a long time. It should be taking a short time. If you organize to get money out of politics and created cross-issue coalitions for that, it could be done in no time at all. It could be done by January of 2025. 
But you got to get the people part of the present system, part of the present give me money system. You got to get rid of them, all of them, as many at least as you can. You can get rid of everybody in the House. You can get rid of one third of the Senate. And you can get rid of the presidential candidates who are taking the big money. You can do that on November 3rd. You can do that in the run-up to November 3rd. You can do that in the primary races still to be run. You can make it quick, in other words. I'd like to be alive when the Medicare for All bill passes. I don't have the time to wait for 2029. I don't have the time to wait for 2033. And the 68,000 people per year or more who are dying due to lack of Medicare for All bill right now don't have the time to waste. And the hundreds of thousands of people who li whose lives are being ruined by medical bankruptcies, the families that have been broken apart by divorces, none of us have time to wait this has to be done in the short run. The movement to get rid of money in politics can accomplish it in the short run. If you guys join that movement and put your shoulders to the wheel of that movement. So Jeff Denton says... Steve Wolperin says, my congressman in Los Angeles is a jerk, too. Jimmy Gomez, he is a jerk. He used to be my daughter's congressman also. I forget who our congressman is now. Uh, Steve says, share to some Facebook groups, including a Medicare for All group. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Steve says, bad money out, good money in. Yeah, the good money is the donations less than $200. Robert Copeland says, a lot of people are single-issue activists. They are. D says, hi, D. Hello, everyone shared earlier. Uh, Jeffrey Denton says, eight years ago, I started lobbying for campaign finance reform, but both parties worked together to block it. Now, Red Berets and whole Washington are planning town halls to talk to people in real life. That is good. That is a good effort. I'm glad they're planning town halls. I'm glad they're planning town halls. But they got to make room for getting money out of politics. They got to stop banging their heads against stone walls. Town halls are great for maintaining support and maybe even increasing support. I'm glad to see that kind of activism. I don't want to rain on the parade of those who want to do that kind of thing. What I'm saying is you got to make room for dump the corruption because that's your main enemy here. That's what's blocking it passing right now. It's not that more support is needed. K says, hi, D. Robert Copeland says, RFK Jr. supporters were tabling at a farmer's market here in Midtown Sacramento just last um, the Saturday. Yeah, he's I supposed to have a lot of volunteers for his campaign. He certainly has the money now to support them. Robert Copeland says, hi, D and Jeffrey. K says, hi, Jeff. Jeff Denton says, hi. Uh, Steve Fulbrand says, hi, D. Uh, Jeffrey. Okay, Robert Copeland says, I bet California Apartment Association is going to spend like $100 million to defeat a ballot measure that will expand rent control here in California called the Justice for Renters Act. There you go. They'll spend a hundred million dollars to block it. To block it. It wouldn't have to go through a ballot measure if you got the people who are in the assembly now and who are in the California Senate now. If you got the people taking the big money kicked out. If you did that, then you wouldn't have to use a ballot measure because the legislature would pass 
the equivalent bill. Governor Newsom will turn out a term out at the end of 2025 or early 2026. Yeah, what he'll probably do is uh, he'll drop out and either try to get into the Senate somewhere between now and then, or he will start running for president when he gets out in early 2026. Robert Copeland says the new state assembly member who will be elected in November 24 elections doesn't support CalCare. Steve says, I invited Fran Bauer to join us. I love that, Steve. Fran Bauer should always join us. Robert Copeland says, that's in my assembly district. Steve Wolfbrand says, Germany passed it in the 1800s. So if I remember correctly, it was passed in 1871 or 1872 by Bismarck, by Otto von Bismarck, the prime minister of Germany at that time. Jeffrey Denton said, when I lobby for Wolfpack, my lobbying partner is a Republican. So during the town halls, I will recruit them to lobby for health care reform too. Recruit them to, to, to lobby for dump the corruption, Jeff. It is so important. And Jeff said earlier, I didn't read this, I should have. Eight years ago, I started lobbying. Oh, no, I did read it. I started lobbying for campaign finance reform. Both parties worked together to block it. Now uh, um, now Red Berets and Hull Washington are planning town halls to talk to people okay, in real life. And I approved of that. Okay. It is now almost time for me to go. D has a 9 p.m. show tonight. Uh She's talking uh, the Fitch assessment of the creditworthiness of China. And I certainly want to be there for that. It's very, very important. It will even get us into MMT, I think. So I'm going over there. I encourage you all to go over to Around the World with Dean and Friends as soon as we are finished here, which is going to be momentarily. Thank you for coming tonight. Okay, attendance. Uh, wasn't as good as it had been in some of the other things, but it was pretty good. Please spread my appeal because at this point, okay, again, if you're for Medicare for All, if you're for the Green New Deal, if you are for free choice okay, for women, if you're for paid family leave, if you're for rent-controlled housing and for ending the housing crisis, it all will be blocked if that big money stays in politics. Our political system is paralyzed by the big money in politics. People of goodwill cannot get good bills passed. Our democracy has been destroyed by the money in politics. If we want to take it back, we've got to have the money out of politics. Yeah, legislation would be great. Constitutional amendment would be great. All that stuff is great. But we can't get any of those passed until we get the money out of politics initially. Because it can't get through the places it has to get through now. It's up to us to get that money out of politics with our votes for candidates, voting for candidates that conform to the rule, to see the rule once more, one final time, get the rule up there again, vote against every candidate except those who won't take money from wealthy corps, individuals, PACs, or party committees, and who repudiate all super PAC support. That's the key. That's the key. There will be survivors who will be left. Vote for the survivors. That's the point. Uh, Jeff says, thanks, Joe. Steve says, this was a good show. Thank you, Steve. Uh, 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 Jeff says, is nonpartisan campaign finance reform? So half of Wolfpack is Republicans, and most of them support Medicare for all. These are the people I have been lobbying with for eight years. Good people, even though they're Republicans. I have a lobby day later this month for tenant rights at the Capitol on April 29th. 
Thank you, Robert, for telling us all about that and for your contributions to this stream. Uh, good night, everybody. Time to go over to D's show.